Fantastic. Okay, so first of all, I'm really excited here to be at the inaugural Cloud GeekWire Cloud Tech Summit. I think it's uh, finally we have one of these conferences here in Seattle, and we don't have to fly around to other parts of the country to actually have to give these talks. Um, so today, what I'm really going to be talking about over the next kind of 40 minutes, uh, actually, first, before some housekeeping, right at the end of this, I do actually have to run and catch a flight, so I won't be able to answer questions at the end, but I did bring Ahmed from my team over here, who's already at the back. Uh, so he can answer any and all questions about this talk. We prepared it together. Uh, so I do apologize for that. So now you know that. Um, so the idea over the next 40 minutes is to really talk about an approach to building what would be like an operating system for AI or how to actually productionize very large scale AI systems. Um, it's not a definitive way of doing it. It's our approach, our opinion. Uh, uh, you know, something to kind of like, if by the end of this uh, talk, you come out with some ideas or some thoughts uh, around it, we would love to hear them. But like really the idea is like, we've saw a problem, uh, we solved it in a certain way, we think it's, you know, a proper way of approaching that architecture uh, and our justification for doing that. Uh, so kind of think of this as a blueprint. So thank you, Todd, for the introduction. Like. Uh, very briefly, I'm the founder and CEO of Algorithmia. We're a local Seattle startup um, with that actually helps companies build out production AI systems. That, that's at the core of what we do. We run an algorithms as a service marketplace, um, and we do very large scale AI systems uh, through that. Um, spent some time at Microsoft, founded a algorithmic trading startup once upon a time that um, I clearly have another job, so it didn't go that great. Uh, and uh, I got my undergrad and master's degrees uh, uh, a long time ago at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So let me first of all introduce Algorithmia and kind of explain what we do and kind of how it inspired us to come up with this blueprint. So our mission as a company is to make state-of-the-art algorithms discoverable and accessible to everyone. And to dig a bit deeper in what we mean by this, when we talk about algorithms, we talk about algorithms, functions, AI models, machine learning models, data science models. Um, and the idea of making them discoverable is whoever the application developer who actually wants to use these models or actually interact with them, how do they find it? How do they find the proper tidbits of intelligence that they want to have in their application uh, and integrate it to it at the right place? And then once they've actually found them, how do they get access to them? How can I call it inside my data center? Can I call it from my Ruby app? Can I call it from my iOS device? Like That's the accessibility part. No matter how I'm actually building these applications, how do I access it? Uh, it becomes important. And so that's at the core of what we do as a company is discoverability and accessibility of uh, algorithms, functions, and models. Uh, and we'll get a little bit into the practicalities of this later, and you'll see what, what I mean by it. So at the core of it, what Algorithmia does is, you know, we're a scalable infrastructure for artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning on demand. Uh, and additionally, on top of that, we have a marketplace that acts for discoverability and monetization of those AI models and functions. We provide a functions as a service functionality that is highly tuned for machine learning and artificial intelligence. We provide a discoverable and live inventory of these modules. We provide a way of monetizing them if you want to and distribute them uh, in a way. And then we also provide a way of composing these all together into a proper pipeline or system. Um, all of this is with the help of really helping developers across the globe. We have this strong belief that every application is going to become an intelligent application over the next couple of years. And the idea is how do we actually reach the developers of the globe and help them build uh, these types of intelligent applications. We're obviously not alone in this. You can see the announcements by Amazon, by Google, by Microsoft, uh, everybody kind of moving in, in that direction. And like, how are we going to actually allow developers to build the next generation of applications? So when we talk about scale and depth, we truly mean it. Today, we support uh, over 40,000 developers and over 3,500 algorithms, functions, and models already on our live marketplace. This includes everything from computer vision, natural language processing, time series analysis, amongst many others. And the way we do that is actually we do this supporting over 10 different programming languages and stacks all at the same time. And this is really what's driven the core of how we've actually built out a stack or what we can say as an OS for it. So what's the problem that we actually faced? So suddenly, 
we have to serve over 3,500 and growing heterogeneous algorithms, which actually each one of them has multiple versions, and we have to be able to call all those versions. So you're really thinking about, at this point, about 40,000 different heterogeneous algorithms, functions, and models that need to be served. They need to be run in parallel uh, in some cases. Each one of them can be called 1 to 1,000 times a second. Uh, with a massive fluctuation in demand and while providing a no DevOps experience to our users. So just as, we, as important as that is that we need to actually uh, provide an overhead of, of, of latency of under 15 milliseconds across the entire system. Um, and we need to be able to allow our users to use any architecture framework that they want to use and execute it on that environment. So when thinking about the problem at this scale, and looking at how we actually had to solve that, this is really what actually guided us into saying, OK, how do we design for a system that has to be able to fulfill these characteristics and is actually growing in size on a daily basis? So to rewind just a little bit, let's talk about the characteristics of, uh, of AI in general. So it usually consists of two distinct phases. Uh, there's a training phase in which the models get created and trained, and this is the idea of, hey, I'm going to go build a computer vision model. Let's go grab a bunch of images, train it, make sure that it's actually producing the results I want. And then once I've actually created that model, it's now there's the inference side of it, which is actually serving that model and being able to be called in whatever the stack we want and how to be able to do it. So these two phases are important. So regardless of training of inference, AI workloads tend to require a lot of computing power. Uh, especially in the deep learning world, those matrix operations are especially GPU and like uh, um, uh, compute intense. And, and, and this is another characteristic of it. So today, AI gets done on an array of heterogeneous hardware. And this is CPUs, GPUs, recently announced TPUs, uh, as well as ASICs, which are specialized hardware that's being done for actually being able to do different machine learning and AI workloads. Finally, AI tasks tend to be more limited by compute than bandwidth. What this means is, especially on the training phase, or like, is that the time it takes to build one of these models or train one of these models is actually a lot larger than what it would take to actually transfer a data set from one place to another. So the compute ends up being the actual limiter versus the actual bandwidth of actually transferring this stuff around. Um, and finally, although there's an ever-growing open source toolkit for building AI and training models, scaling it and doing the actual operations behind it is a much more complicated and expensive task that not from a compute, only from a compute perspective, but also for an oper operationalization perspective as well. Okay, so I mentioned that there's usually two phases uh, for AI. So let's first talk about training. And this is pretty much the only stuff I'm going to talk about training. The rest that we're going to be talking about is operationalizing throughout the rest of the today. So training is actually building a model. Uh, it's a task that's usually done by a very specialized data scientist, machine learning engineer, PhDs in a lot of cases. Uh, for example, if you want to train a classifier to tell you if uh, something is a, one food or the other. So what would usually happen is that this training tends to be a long-running task. Um, it, there is uh, no sudden increases or decreases in demand, so it's somewhat fixed in terms of like once you're actually building out, you're going to do the training phase, the actual capacity of the system at training time tends to be fixed. Um, maybe, you know, let's say the example of this, we're going to go and figure out if a classifier can say if something's a hot dog or not a hot dog, uh, and you're going to feed an image for that. And so that maybe you actually have 50,000 trained pairs in this, and where you say, OK, here's the images that are hot dogs, and here's the not. So in passing all those images, you're probably going to be passing them into the training mechanism at a constant rate. And since the rate is constant, therefore, it's a fixed load across the entire system. Statefulness ends up being extremely important. As, we, you know, as you're training, you're gonna, it's very important to be able to save checkpoints and the weights during that process. So the state of the system actually becomes very important. And then finally, you tend to feed data from a single data source. That might be your HDFS, it might be a NAS, it might be an S3 bucket, but it tends to be somewhere from a single user and from a single data source. So an analogy here is to say, 
uh, in the dev tool chain is that the training part of it is like when you go build an app, right? So when you're actually building an app, you're iterating through it, you're going, like you're building the app over and over again, you're doing iterations, you're saving checkpoints, you're checking it in, and it's very similar in that model, which is a single user, maybe a couple users, but like it's a, 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 it goes straight from there. So usually this is quite framework specific. So when you're training a model in one framework or the other, you're usually sticking to it. There's a specific dev tool chain for that framework. So let's say you're working in TensorFlow or you're working in uh, Scikit-Learn or something like that. Um, and it's an iterative process. Today we see multiple tools around building these apps or AI models. Things like Keras and TensorFlow and Microsoft CNTK and now Amazon's bet on MXNet um, are good examples of that. But what we're really going to concentrate on talking about today is the inference side of things. What happens once I've actually trained a model and I actually need to serve it at a very high scale? And because this is rarely talked about, and there's no, almost nobody talks about it at the end of the tutorials of using any of these tools as well. What do I do when I now have to go into production? Um, and so that's what we're going to actually really concentrate on today because it's the next gap in terms of actually building serious intelligent applications is actually being able to put them into production. So let's take a use case. So Xin Yang is building his app called Seafood. And what this app is going to do is as I take pictures of foods, it's going to tell me if it's a food or not, what food it is. So Yin Yang spent a countless amount of hours working by himself, training a model, feeding it massive amounts of food uh, images, and classifying that. He's done this in his favorite deep learning framework. He's built the classification model. He's probably either worked locally or on a VM on his favorite cloud provider. He's rented a GPU instance, and he's been able to go through that training process. So this is great. So what this looks like is now he, Ying Yang has deployed his trained model to a GPU-enabled instance on his favorite cloud provider. Fairly simple, grab the TensorFlow model, loaded it up into, let's say, a P2 instance on AWS, um, and now his iPhone app or Android app is sending that image to that instance and it's responding saying, is this a hot dog or is it not a hot dog? This is all good. So what happens now? He publishes it to the app store. Apparently, looking for food in your refrigerator and classifying it becomes extremely possible, uh, popular. Suddenly, overnight, thousands of developers have downloaded his application and are sending classification images to his server. So what happens now? Well, what happens is that his server is going to crash. Uh, most of these models, especially in a single instance, can only process images in a serial way. They have to do uh, uh, you know, a propagation through that. So now with thousands of images coming in at the same time, the server is overloaded. Remember that his classification model can only classify one image at the time. And even that, every single time, takes a couple of seconds. So here comes the problem of rapidly scaling and serving the demand of what would be a popular live production application. Um, and this will become a more and more, a, a bigger problem the more popular that building these type of application uh, exists. So really quickly, now that we have our use case in mind, let's talk about the, you know, kind of like the big obvious problem of scaling AI systems, which is how do I serve concurrent users at a very high scale in an easy way? So two paradigms that we'll be discussing today, which you probably hear a million times today, and I hope you guys are playing bingo with these words, uh, are microservices and services. And so the idea, which are both extremely popular and important parts of how we believe a blueprint for building an OS for AI looks like. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail onto what microservices are or what serverless are, because there's literally, I think, a track next door uh, that is going to be talking about that all day. Um, but the idea here is that in microservices, the, the goal of a, is the design of a system is independently deployable and loosely coupled services. So versus building a monolithic application, breaking up the components, and being able to serve those completely independently, but also develop those completely independently. So the advantages here includes easier maintainability, asterisk to a certain degree, you have to track down these things. 
scalability, and then rolling deployments. Serverless is encapsulation, starting and stopping uh, of, of certain functions uh, per request uh, with a just-in-time compute model. So you only pay for what you need. Its advantages include cost efficiency, concurrency is built in, and the speed of development and improved latency. And I'll talk a little bit about why these things uh, matter. So all of these are crucial components of what a operating system for AI, for AI might look like, and you'll see why. So we talked about the characteristics of training. Um, now let's talk about the inference, which is that actually serving that model. Where training was owned by the data scientist, machine learning engineer, inference is actually a task that makes more sense to be owned by DevOps or enterprise architecture. Uh, it's the people responsible for the pipes. In the case of our seafood app, it's the phase where we upload the model and we make it available as services to thousands of mobile phones on websites across the globe. The characteristics of the phase are often short bursts of very intense compute, classifying an image might take 100 milliseconds to maybe a couple seconds. It's elastic. Many people use the application at a certain time. Going from one image per second to potentially hundreds of images per second requires an increase in resources. And it means more machines, and in this case, more GPUs. It's stateless. Since we're classifying an image, not training it, we actually don't care what was the classification before and after. So it's a completely stateless task. And the result of one classification obviously doesn't affect the other. And on top of that, it needs to be able to be used by multiple users on multiple different stacks and multiple different platforms. So in this case, what we believe is the actual inference is more analog to an OS. It's running concurrent tasks that require uh, uh, scheduling. So we have these two verticals, the training and the inference side, and they're similar to building an app and then actually running multiple apps. The building of an app is very framework dependent. Every use case is unique. There are many efforts out there to try to make it a better experience, Keras being a good example of this. However, running heterogeneous models simultaneously and very analogous to how an operating system works. It's about sharing of resources between models, prioritizing them, monitoring them. Um, and it's the world where you've shipped the app, and now it's just running at a massive scale. And this is the side what we're actually going to focus on today. So, Let's start talking through these uh, characteristics. So the first one is, on the training side, we talked about how it's a long compute cycle, fixed load, stateful, and single user. VMs or bare metal tend to be a good solution for this. You can set up the environment, you can deploy it, you can scale it vertically, which means just actually making a larger instance, uh, and that usually works pretty well. Um, these are VMs and bare metal are good options for these characteristics. For inference, though, containers are a much better fit, uh, given how quickly they can be initialized, they're much lighter weight, they're extremely portable, uh, and they can very quickly be replicated and run in parallel. So by the, and also, by default, containers are stateless. So containers give us fast and stateless two things we require for our operating system. The third big one is an elastic since demand, uh, you know, is being elastic since demand will change over time. We believe that a technology that is very good for this is Kubernetes, designed for running multiple pods, provisioning machines, and scaling them up and down is perfect for this task. So now we have this idea that we can get this stateless, very lightweight containers, combining them with a platform that allows for scaling up and down, uh, such as Kubernetes. So the first, which is allowing multiple users, the last one, which is allowing multiple users and multiple platforms to be able to access this. And this is where REST APIs come in. So we get fast and stateless from containers, you get elastic scale from Kubernetes, and the last component we need is accessibility from multiple users and usually multiple clients and devices. REST APIs are the final components allowing us to connect any model from any mobile app, web application, or IoT device. REST APIs are, by definition, universal. So combining Docker, Kubernetes, and REST APIs, we have essentially built our own microservices architecture. So what do we get with a microservices architecture? We get elastic compute, adding more or less machines on demand. We get scalability, which is our system is not fixed capacity. We get it to be software agnostic, 
We can use runtimes in multiple languages, AI frameworks, et cetera. And we get hardware agnostic, which means our platform can run on any cloud or almost any other hardware. So now let's go into the next step, which is like, why should we, exp let's explore why serverless. These three components in the serverless world that make sense for here are cost efficiency, concurrency, and improved latency. So let's go into actual cost efficiency. First, let's actually explore what Ying Yang's seafood app might actually look like. So this is the daily app usage. You can see that usually people at lunch tend to actually send a lot more images because they're curious about recognizing what they're about to eat. So in this particular case, if we would go with a, uh, you know, you can see how during lunch it's all the way up, max number of calls per second at around 160, um, the number of GPU server instances that would be required to be able to serve that load, and the hypothetical for that. So in a traditional design architecture, you would have to design for the maximum. This is what we usually call capacity planning. And so in this case, you would actually have to say, okay, what is gonna be the maximum amount of compute I'm gonna meet at any given time, and plan for that. This is, as you can see, extremely wasteful. And so we've calculated our you know, completely invented numbers of, of cost to about $25,000 a month to be able to support this app. Great. So the next step could be actually designed for the local maximum. So this is kind of going back to the pure microservices architecture, which is looking at essentially as giving signals of out of time, being able to scale up and down based on uh, you know, the different fluctuations. So this is usually done as step functions, um, and it's a huge cost improvement. As you can see, we went from $26,000 to almost half uh, with $12,000 amount in that traditional architecture. Now, if we actually apply a serverless architecture, we can actually design for the minimum. Every single time there's an API call, we can instantiate, launch, and serve the request. Um, and duplicate that across the system. So we're literally actually only paying for the compute that needed at the time of actually serving that request. This results in an 85% cost reduction on the system and efficiency on the utilization of your using across your entire uh, AI system. So uh, just automatically being going up and down, the demand is highly efficient and serverless architecture is really perfect for this. So we got the cost efficiency side of things. So the second one is concurrency. We're potentially gonna have thousands of users at the same time sending hundreds of images per second. Since we know each model can only process serially, then horizontal scaling will actually allow us to serve the actual requests that are all coming into the system. And supporting that is crucial. A serverless architecture allows us to very quickly, easily replicate this model horizontally and be able to serve those requests with some basic load balancing. Um, and again, this is all stateless, so it's very easy to replicate and transport. Um, finally, which is latency. Because it's stateless, because it's a serverless architecture, and because I can replicate it very quickly, I can actually serve these models across the globe in different data centers and different places so that wherever the request is coming in from, we can actually ensure the lowest latency possible to actually go ahead and serve that model. And so these are the three promises of, that serverless brings to the system, which allows us for cost efficiency, actually horizontal scaling, and then finally reducing the latency all the way down. So following the basic principles of microservices and serverless architecture, plus using this modern cloud native tool set is great and will get you started down the right path. But this is also kind of table stakes. Anybody building these systems is kind of looking at it this way. This is kind of pretty obvious um, in, in, in doing it. So there's other critical parts that really require making this platform cohesive, especially with dealing with machine learning and deep learning workflows. These things are like GPU memory management, where we allow users to call deep learning algorithms, load them into GPU memory, compute, and return the result immediately. Just as a kind of cliff note here, we've spent the last 30 years optimizing multi-tenancy on CPUs. We have not been doing that on GPUs. So it's kind of actually doing proper memory management on GPUs is still very, very nascent area, uh, and you run into a whole lot of problems. So anybody who here who's worked in deep learning probably can tell you uh, that they've run un into memory issues before. Um, and then prioritizing or doing intelligent orchestration of the uh, containers based on how the 
pipelines are being generated uh, becomes very important to reduce latency. And then using interprocess communications instead of HTTP is another way of doing that. So I'm going to talk about all of these concept of like what would be required uh, you know, to continue building out the OS for AI. So just to kind of bring into what an operating system is, I know what is an OS about? It's about prioritizing tasks. It's about sharing resources between tasks, GPUs, memory, CPUs. It's about hardware abstraction, uh, in our world, maybe cloud abstraction. And an OS in general would consist of a kernel responsible for these tasks, and then shells and services for doing everything else. So let's get a lens on this and, and think about what an OS for AI might look like. So this is kind of what we think the OS for AI might look like. So at the top, we'll see these shells and services. This is the part that the user interacts with, or the website, additional to non-core services and applications. We're talking about auth, monitoring, uh, you know, serving like the general like, website, et cetera. The second layer is the actual kernel. This is really what defines an OS at the most technical level. It's what enables time sharing, multitasking, et cetera. At algorithmia.com specifically, we are made up of these two layers. The website, which where users can use to discover algorithms submitted by others. We offer a level of data abstraction, so you can call an algorithm from HDFS or S3 or an Azure blob. You can manage API keys, et cetera, et cetera. These are the shells and services. The core of what we do and kind of the secret sauce to the technology lies in the kernel. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the coming slides, these little purple boxes at the bottom. So the kernel is not only about launching a new server instance, uh, when we need to, but also how do we minimize latency, maximize cluster utilization uh, when algorithm A calls algorithm B. And it also makes decisions on what algorithms to keep in memory and what to unload all in a fraction of a second and allow users to run on hybrid clouds or burst into clouds or different zones when they need to. So the first one that we're going to talk about is elastic scale. So this is a high level of a simple elastic serverless architecture. So just to get you through the steps, an API, an API call comes in from the user, hits the API load balancer, reaches the API server. Uh, from here, what we have the API is what they call a job. The API server assigns this job to a job scheduler. The scheduler has full view of a worker pool. The worker pool consists of server instances with each server or worker holding multiple slots. A slot is an availability to initialize and run a Docker container. And if a slot is available for that API and key algorithm to run, then we feed it the job, compute the result, and return it to the user. If not slots available, then we initialize it then wherever the worker makes sense and run that job. So speed is obviously very important. In our case, we've managed on AWS to achieve uh, from 15 milliseconds from the elastic load balancer to the algorithm entry point on a standard AWS hardware. But your mileage might vary depending on your topology and what hardware and what clusters you're using. So if you actually go ahead and build this, congratulations, you just built AWS Lambda. Um, and that's essentially what the architecture would look like. So, how do we do this actually for AI, though? Like, what, what, what are the differences here that, that matter for AI? So let's go back to our full uh, example, which is what happens when uh, I want to classify food. What happens in most of these AI workloads is that it's not just one model, but actually a composition of an ensemble of multiple models to actually get the highest result possible. So composability is crucial to AI workflows because of data processing, pipelining, and uh, ensembles. So in our recognizer, what would have actually probably happened, instead of having one generic model that just recognizes food, is that you would have probably divided it into multiple models that each one of them have a higher accuracy to have a higher accuracy across the system. So something, and like, I'm completely oversimplifying it, but maybe the first thing we do is, hey, I have a very, very high accurate model that says, is this a vegetable or is this a fruit? And if it is a fruit, then I'm going to go send it to my fruit classifier, which is going to be able to bring out the categories of fruit. And if it is a vegetable, I'll be able to bring it out to my vegetable classifier, and it'll be that. And that way, that composability is going to actually allow me to have overall higher accuracy in a true system. So then in that case, we actually need to do the kernel needs to be in charge of not doing elastic scale, but also intelligent orchestration. So an OS will want to capture the information around resource utilization for each component, 
but also understand what the chain's compositions to be able to allocate those resources intelligently. So in this case, the system on OS would need to know, hey, you have this food classification model, which is really just telling you, is it a fruit or a vegetable? And it uses a certain amount of CPU and GPU and memory and I.O. And then that is actually going to be calling out two other ones, which might be our fruit classifier or our vegetable classifier. And each one of those has resource constraints and utilization there. So an OS should be aware of this so that it can actually go and make intelligent decisions around the abstraction and allocation of resources. So in our example here, the OS not only knows that each component uses X, Y, and Z, but also understands that algorithm A always calls algorithm B, and that algorithm A consumes certain things, and that algorithm B consumes certain other ones. And therefore, it needs to start making intelligent decisions around how do I reduce network latency, how do I increase the cluster utilization, and how do I build out these dependency graphs. So the second part of the kernel is actually runtime abstraction. So anybody who's worked in this space knows that there's a whole number of tools, and they're, you, know, you expect them to clobber them together. So that you code that you see maybe for the food classifier was written by one team in Python. And however, when everything's running in Docker container and via universal API, we can actually compose across stacks. So maybe one thing was written in Python, another one was written in Java, another one was written in R. And because of this abstraction, that is totally OK, and they can actually be used versus having to force everything onto the same stack. So you want to use a sentiment analysis algorithm. You know, this is a personal point of frustration. You see, like anybody wants to go use sentiment analysis, the first search they do is sentiment analysis and the language that they're comfortable in. That's really bad practice, right? Because you should be using whatever the best algorithm or library is for your data set, not a language specific. So this abstraction is extremely important in terms of being able to call over uh, multiple different languages. Uh, the problem shouldn't be runtime based. You should be able to use anything you want in any model in any language. So the last part about the kernel um, is really about DevOps. And uh, you know, the idea here is that like, you should be able, like, if I look at the example on the top, it shows what I would have done if I would have specifically written against one specific storage. And, but an OS, the whole point about OS is, is being able to abstract like, different types of storages. So an example on the bottom I'm showing is that how actually by doing this type of get, I can actually feed it an S3 blob, an HDFS, a Dropbox. I can find and replace whatever it is that that uh, data source is and feed it into any of the components in my OS for AI. This becomes specifically like, important if you're trying to deploy across all these stacks. So if you think about environment abstraction, when you build a model, and especially on your quest to encourage composability, like you're going to want to actually have to adapt to potentially building across the different types of layers, load balancing, remote storage that exist across all the clouds, including on-premise. And so these abstractions become extremely important. So to sum it all up, what makes an OS for AI? It should be stack agnostic. It should allow for composability. It should be self-optimizing. It should auto-scale. And it should be monitorable. Finally, there should be a discovery layer, which means allow users to discover components of AI that it either uh, they or their colleagues have created, easily integrate those into their workflows. And similar, how do you find a repository on GitHub or an app on an app store? You should be able to bring those components into uh, you know, your AI. Uh, uh, OS for AI. So to kind of conclude on the history of operating systems, you know, we've essentially been marked by the increase, uh, you know, increasing abstraction. We started with punch cards and assembly code, raw assembly code. Then came Unix, allowing for multi-tenancy and composability or piping. This was an increase in abstraction. Then came DOS, which allowed for running the same OS on different hardware, and we got hardware abstraction. Then came the GUI, which would provide accessibility a yet another level of abstraction. And finally, came OSs like iOS and Android, which added discoverability. So an OS's ability to add things, an operating system is on its own, is no good. What you want is to be able to find and discover expanding capabilities for that OS. So where is AI, AI today? So on the spectrum of punch cards all the way to iOS or Android, we're actually probably closer to punch cards. 
data science, machine learning, and especially deep learning workflows are much more brittle than flexible. There's a lot of literature on how to train a learning model with a specific framework on a specific architecture, and very careful to put together all this environment. Things run in batches rather than in real time. We only have one mainstream, we really only have one mainstream hardware manufacturer for GPUs, which is NVIDIA. Uh, and this is the equivalent of IBM in the 70s. So there are many attempts to move things up one level of uh, abstraction layer. In terms of higher level languages, we're seeing great initiatives like Keras. Uh, in terms of hardware, soon you will see greater urgency to standardize hardware as more options become mainstream, such as TPUs. And then there's the role of the operating system, the pipes that make things work together cohesively. That's the role of the cloud-based operating system for AI. And that is all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed that. If you want to test out algorithmia.com, that code gets you 50 bucks on the platform. So feel free to take pictures. Um, that's my email. I'd love to hear your comments, strong opinions, disagreements any day. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, Ahmed's there in the back if he can answer questions. And thank you very much for listening today. <laughs>